So I would like to have discussion. My presentation is, if I run through it, it's maybe 15 minutes, okay? When uh, Dr. Campbell introduced his, he said he was gonna be at a high level. Well, I'm not bringing it down any closer to, to the earth than, than his presentation. I think you'll see a lot of similarities. Um, but I would like discussion and feedback. It's an important part of how we approach things in Syngenta. So as James introduced me, I'm responsible for our seed development programs. That's basically our breeding programs, it's Syngenta. We, I'm responsible for a group of people who develop better genetics for farmers. Now this audience may be familiar with that, seeds for farmers, but I find it remarkable how many people I speak to, they ask me, what do I do? And I tell them, we develop seeds for farmers. They just like, seeds for farmers? Why do you do that? They just don't even understand that there are people called plant breeders who develop better genetics for farmers. But we're part of an industry that spends billions of dollars a year in the science to develop new seeds for farmers. Okay, is that close enough? All right, thanks. Um, but I wanna start, since this is a data conference, you guys are data scientists, I wanna start with a data analytics question. It's a very simple one, I hope. I hope the projector works. I assume this is the go button. Oh, it might not be plugged in. It's not plugged in, okay, there we go. <laughs> and do you have yeah, a yeah, report on the left? On the left? All right, let's try that. <coughs> Sounds good. What's wrong with that statement? You're data scientists. Human numbers have grown exponentially in the last hundred years. <laughs> very true. See that? That's a very straight line. That is very linear, okay? The fact is population growth is linear and has been for quite a while. It's still a big issue. Population growth creates a whole array of issues, which we were talking about just before lunch. But it's not a crisis. And I bring this point up because you resolve things differently. You react differently in the situation. So that really awful movie last year, if anybody saw it, Inferno, was all based on this belief the population doubles every time. Well, it simply doesn't. So it's a solvable problem. Still a big problem. Now, when I was in grade school, young kid, this is the late 60s and early 70s, it was an accepted position, accepted that we were going to end in a global catastrophe. I and mean, this was actually accepted. In fact, a lot of the models said it would happen by now. Human population was gonna to continue to expand exponentially. We we're gonna deplete all the food and water and other resources and we we're gonna be buried in trash and pollution. All the models said this, really. It was not a matter of if that was gonna happen, it was simply a matter of when. And some of the models said within 50 years. Well, what actually happened is human population was pretty inconsistent, slow growth, and then around the age the scientific age, the beginning of the scientific age, is when population began to increase exponentially. It was when innovation became the norm, when we started to invent. We had the industrial revolution, we had the agricultural revolution. It enabled that growth. But the exponential period actually stopped around 1965. It's been linear since then, and it's actually starting to slow. So that's actually a good thing. It's still a challenge, it's a challenge, but it's not a catastrophe. So what really did happen since I was a kid in grade school? The world did not end. I know that with confidence. What did happen in the last 50 years, population did grow very dramatically. More than doubled, 3.3 billion to 7.4 billion. Huge growth. But the amazing thing, the totally unexpected thing, was during that period of unprecedented population growth, we also had unprecedented improvement in the quality of life. In that period of time, global life expectancy increased almost 20 years. Since 1960 to today, global life expectancy is 20 years longer. In 50 years, it improved 20 years. It's unbelievable. The main contributor 
was a reduction in child mortality. In 1960, in the average in the world, 20% child mortality, one out of five children died before the age of five in 1960. I was alive at this time. Now that's down well below 1% in most developed countries and it's getting there quickly in the developing world. So that's some pretty significant improvements in quality of life while this incredible growth in population. How did we do it? You know the answer to that too. It's one word. All of those are part of the same word. Innovation. It's innovation. We had innovation in medicine. We had innovation in agriculture. We had innovation in sanitation. Innovation, because human beings are the only thing in nature that can solve problems. You can say it's what it means to be human. We solve problems, right? We are not constrained by evolution. We can choose changes. So what happened in agricultural production in this period of time, we not only met the challenge of the growing population, we far exceeded it. Grain production in the last 50 years, almost fourfold increase. Soybean production, 11-fold increase in 50 years. 80% of that growth came from productivity, yield per hectare, not by adding more hectares, but by driving up the yield per hectare. That's how we met the demand. So it's quite an amazing story of human ingenuity overcoming what was, met, what was expected to be a catastrophic challenge. Even if you look around the world today and you compare countries, because what was the quote that, uh, you know, it's not distributed equally. If you look around the world today, in those countries which are still primarily agrarian societies, that is more than half of the population is engaged in agriculture, they have 10 times the average child mortality in 18 years shorter lifespan on average than countries with the most advanced agricultural technology. Agricultural technology is the basis of these improvements in quality of life and antibiotics and uh, vaccinations as well. <laughs> While this was going on, this great increase in agricultural output, it was an even greater increase in productivity, labor productivity. 1817 in North America, sorry I'm in Canada, I use the United States, but it's true of all of North America. In 1817, it required two farmers to feed three people. Two thirds of the people lived and worked on the farm. On top of two? Nope, doing nope. Okay. They themselves plus one, right? That was 200 years ago. 100 years later, the productivity had doubled. That was the beginning of the use of mechanization and fertilization and some better genetics. We would actually gotten to where it only took one person could feed three. They could feed themselves and two others. That was a great advance. The 100 years after that, productivity increased by a staggering 25-fold. So now one farmer feeds 80 people in North America. Where did they go? It used to be that two-thirds of the people lived on farms and worked on farms. And now you got one and a half percent of the people live and work on farms. Where did they go? Where are all the people? They went to the cities. And what did they do when they got there? They became doctors and engineers, and some were lawyers, <laughs> in industry, and professional athletes, and, and data scientists. Guys, there wouldn't be data scientists if there weren't this level of agricultural productivity, because you'd all be working on a farm. All throughout history, we have made these improvements in agriculture by very simple methods with a lot of patience, okay? This example, this is the ear of the Tiacente plant. The Tiacente plant is a wild grass that is in um, Middle America, Central America, Mexico. This is what the prehistoric uh, Mesoamericans started with. And out of that, they developed what today we have as corn or maize. It's so distant in characteristics from today's corn 
that it wasn't until the last about 10 years with when we could do all the genetic fingerprinting that we finally con confirmed this is the progenitor of corn. It's actually very closely related genetically. That ear is about the size of my little finger, and it has 12 seeds. That's what they started with. And just by repetitive selection over millennia, they developed, I assume, everybody's familiar with what an ear of corn looks like today. This is domestication, right? This is the way that we, as humans, have guided nature to our purposes over time. But this is very simple methods. It's like when I was first a plant breeder, this would have been 20 years ago, what plant breeders did is they walk around out in the field and they look at things. You use your eyes. You're looking for the plants that have better disease resistance or better drought tolerance or more uniformity because that was the only tool you really had. You got to remember it was 1953 when Watson and Crick announced the structure of DNA. Before that, we had no idea what the molecular basis of heredity was. We didn't even, we wouldn't even sure it was DNA. So we've come a long way with some very simple methods. But now I want to stop talking about the past and I want to start talking about the future. Because as phenomenal as that, those achievements were, we're clearly not done. No matter which population model you look at, the, the global population is going to grow significantly. Two billion, two and a half billion, three billion in the next 50 years. That's going to require us to increase agricultural output by the same amount over the next 50 years as what we did in the last 50 years. So like I said, while that line is not catastrophic, it's a huge challenge. We have to accomplish in the next 50 years what we accomplished in the last 50 years in output. But the problem is more complex than that, which gets back to the conversation we were having before lunch. Now as we become more confident in our ability to meet the food demand of our growing population, we're more concerned with the impact of the whole system. We're concerned with sustainability. We're concerned with the environmental impact that we have, with the preservation of biodiversity, with the protection of workers. Agriculture is one of the most dangerous uh, uh, industries. It's Syngenta's very strong belief that we can achieve the improvement in productivity and output that we need and accomplish all these things at the same time, that these are not in conflict with each other. We call that good growth. That's our name for that. We can grow while achieving these things. And we have a plan, which we call the good growth plan. <laughs> the good growth plan is a collaborative project between ourselves and growers and governments and NGOs to develop not only a set of targets and approaches to these problems, but to measure them and report on them using not only our own data, but third-party data and external validation and uh, uh, confirmation through audits. And we work with the Open Data Institute to set the standards for the data and help us to publish the data and make it available for other scientists to be able to work with. You can read about it at goodgrowthplan.com. But you can see it's about food productivity, biodiversity, f maintenance of farmland, and also about the workers. With most agriculture in the world is still by smallholders, keeping people safe and making sure that the labor conditions are fair. Every year we publish the results tracking our performance against the targets. The one thing that I'm really confident about, I'm confident we can accomplish all that, but I'm absolutely certain that those methods that got us that improvement of the last 50 years are not going to get us what we need in the next 50 years. We're not going to get there by walking around looking at things. The easy stuff's already been done. We are way up the curve of diminishing returns. Now we're going to get into the era of data-driven decision-making. We have to get into analytics. It's way beyond what our mind can conceive of alone. We have to look at characteristics that are far beyond what our eyes can detect. Now, we're fortunate because the technology wave is still ahead of us. We have 
the data now that even 10 years ago we didn't have. 10 years ago, we lacked both the access, the availability of the data, and the data quality to be able to do any of the analysis necessary to improve our agricultural outputs. Today, I mean, just take, for example, uh, genotyping, genetic fingerprinting. In a period of 15 years, the cost to do genetic sequencing dropped by 100,000-fold. 100,000-fold. So it cost a million dollars before, cost $10 now. So we routinely genotype, do a genetic fingerprint on all the new genetics we develop. So we have hundreds of thousands of new genetic lines that we have genetic fingerprints on every year. So we generate a lot of data. We also have very high density weather data now, recording all the weather parameters, wind speed, light intensity, the heat, humidity, and a high density grid constantly throughout the season. We have uh, the phenotype data. We talked about satellite image data. We have drone collected phenotype data. We have the data directly off the harvesting machinery at the time of harvest. We had all this data. One thing is in the last 10 years, we went from data poor to data rich in agriculture. In fact, I would say data drowning. We have the data. We're not entirely sure how to manage it. Why well, we have things like the big data uh, in, that, uh, in Illinois. Because right now we're just trying to figure out how to manage the data. We've barely even started to explore the data and how to uh, find the insights that are in there. But what we do know is it's going to follow a pattern like other technical endeavors have followed. The past was about you go out and you observe and you describe. This plant grew here. It was really hot. Didn't look too good. Probably doesn't like growing in the heat. Now we're building models. We're bringing the phenotype, the genotype, the environment information together to build the models of the relationships. That's what this AI challenge was about. The models allow us to predict. As we get better at predicting, we can start to actually design the outcomes. We're not the first industry to do this. In fact, we're probably the last, right? Every technical endeavor in the past worked from a trial and error approach. Let's try it and see. You think of how the Wright brothers built air, their aircraft. But we don't do that anymore. We don't build aircraft or cars. We don't design new ones by, well, let's just try it and see, right? We have models, and the models are built on basic principles of physics. We're now just starting to bring biology into this era where we can actually build the models sufficiently that we can predict the outcomes rather than just trying things at random. Now, it's not going to be that simple in biologi biological systems like agriculture. Agricultural um, systems, the, the, the biological uh, organisms themselves are very diverse. It's much more challenging than a mechanical engineering problem. You also have the diversity of an unstable environment. The plants live outside. The environment and the ecosystem itself are actually changing all the time. <laughs> but the, the pests are evolving as well. Cropping patterns change. The demand for the outputs change. So the growers change their, their practices. All this is changing. And we're trying to develop models within this changing environment. There's still a great deal of variability in the productivity and the output in agricultural practice. These are national average yields of maize or corn, from 2 tons in Kenya to 11 tons in the US. Now, part of that, of course, is environmental, things out of the control of the grower, sun, light, and mostly water. But an equal proportion is a matter of choices that the grower makes. What genetics he chooses to grow, how he fertilizes, how he manages pests, what his cropping rotation is, his sequence, his agronomic practices, are equally important to this range in outcomes. 
that's where the data-driven decision-making needs to come in, is to start to bring the best practices in at a data level. These should be data-driven decisions. That's where the next advance is going to come in agricultural productivity. Here's a real simple example. This is one corn hybrid in North America. And if you look at, on the far left, if you just grow this hybrid indiscriminately, what you see is it actually has a performance disadvantage. It underperforms other hybrids that a grower could choose. But if you choose the growing uh, uh, management and the soil and the placement correctly, this hybrid will outperform. That difference between minus seven and plus five, that yield advantage, more than a 5% yield improvement, that can easily be the difference between profit and loss for a farmer. Very often, the profit margin for a farmer is no more than 5%. So choosing the right thing in the right place can make that big a difference. And you can see the scale factor, right? A 5% difference in yield in North America has a $2.5 billion impact on agricultural output. But this is actually a very simple example. We can do this. We can look at the environmental data. We can look at the performance data. We can say this product performs better in these situations. We can go and we can say, where are those situations likely to happen? So where should this product be grown? And where should it not be grown? That's very basic. It's a good step, but it's not going to get us to where we need to get to. To design better products, better genetics, we're going to have to understand not just that it performed differently, but why? Why it performed differently? The reason that some hybrids do better in some environments than others is because of their genetics. It's at the genetic level, right? Different genes responding to environmental stimuli in different ways. We are just starting to scratch the surface on this problem. Dissecting environmental response down to the gene level to say what genes respond to what stimuli. So this happens to be a flowering control model. If I want to move flowering earlier or later, well, in a hot environment, in a cold environment, in a short day, in a long day, we have to dissect this down to the individual genes and the, low, and the uh, alleles that respond to those environments, and we can now start to construct a more stable flowering, an earlier flowering, a heat-insensitive flowering. That's really at the front edge. But even if we get all that, okay, we get to where we understand the environmental response at the gene level, we're still not going to be able to make exact predictions. There is no fortune teller. We cannot go to the fortune teller and say, what's going to happen? Because it's an unstable environment. You can't predict the environment sufficiently in the ecosystem as well. We are in, an, in a probabilistic um, uh, environment. We need to think differently. Our models should not be looking at deterministic outputs, but at probabilistic outputs. What's the probability of weather patterns and pest patterns compared to the probability of uh, crop response? But we are getting better. We're going to move through these phases as an industry. The first phase we've been in, we call it the descriptive phase. We've got the data. We can say, hey, this did better than that. We can say, it was dry. That's what we can say. We can't say, will this do better than that next year if it's dry or if it's wet? That's when we start to get into the predictive phase. <clears throat> That's right where we are right now. We're just entering the predictive phase where we can start to say what will happen in another set of situations. <clears throat> We're just starting. We have more, most of the work is still about managing the data and assembling the data to be able to approach these problems. In Syngenta, every year we put out two or three challenge questions, one of them this year being the AI challenge on this topic. Here's the data. Here's the weather data. Here's the genotype data. Here's the phenotype data. Can you find a model that will give reasonable predictiveness? In the future is what I was talking about at that gene level, when you get into the prescriptive, where you can start to actually design for a better outcome. 
because you understand the mechanisms. That's still a way out there right now on the data curve. But we're getting better. We're going to make better decisions from the data. We're going to be more efficient. You can certainly see the insights already starting to affect grower behaviors. And for the better decisions, we're going to increase productivity. We're going to reduce risk. We're going to reduce our impact on the environment. We're going to preserve biodiversity, and we're going to protect the workers. That's our commitments. So this is my kind of summary, where we're at in agriculture. I believe we are data rich, as I would say, excessively, but we are insight poor. We don't really know much yet. We're only starting to figure out how to investigate the data. We're working in a highly complex system. I would frankly say we are working in the most highly complex system. In that example I showed before, even in one crop, the maize plant, is more genetic diversity than all humans. That's just one of our crops, right? So I will tell you my belief, agriculture is the most complex system. It's much more complex than medicine. Crops don't get to come in from outside. They don't live in the air conditioning in a heated environment. They have to deal with the environmental impacts. But the other thing we have going for us is we have a very meaningful purpose. We have to create the technology that will enable us to sustainably feed the world while minimizing the environmental impact and maximizing safety and biodiversity. It's a very meaningful purpose. So that's where we are. That's why I think the next agriculture revolution is when data feeds the world. 